Welcome to the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast. This is Dr. Jay Calvert. I am coming to you today with my fun size co host, <laughs> Dr. Millicent Ravello. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. I, I wanted to say that because we're talking about <laughs> big ass body lifts today. Big ass body lifts. You can, you can have like a, a big ass body lift or you can have like a big ass body lift. Like it really, like the, the surgery changes based on where you put the emphasis on that. Yes. <laughs> and we're talking about all of the above. All of the above. Sometimes they're both. Yeah. But I, I've, I've liked it because, you know, in the office, in a special drawer in, in the admin area of our office, there is a little candy drawer that the girls keep very well stocked yes, and they are do. probably responsible for some staph liposuction <laughs> cases that we've done. But of course, in there are the fun size Snickers. Yep. Sure and are. this is our fun size surgeon. <laughs> and then usually I couldn't find the king size Snickers, but I did find one. The king size Snickers are the patients that you're doing the big ass body lifts. Oh on. my gosh. That's a very good apt description. Yes. I mean, we have the Reese's Yes. A com- a comparison to we got the king size Reese's <laughs> and of course the fun size mini Reese's. So, you know, we have uh, big operations, small surgeon. Yeah, exactly. And I, and the reason this is coming up is because I've been on a tear like this past month of of record breaking um, body lifts and yes, you have body contouring procedures. And every time that I finish one, I say, I'm, I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud that I just broke that record <laughs> because it. what I'm talking about is the amount of skin and fat that I'm removing in a single procedure. And I, I, it's, I have this story because I have a new PA, a new physician's assistant that just started working with me. And so she's kind of brand new to the world of operative plastic surgery. And so I'm trying to explain to her the different procedures that I do. These are tummy tucks. These are you know body contouring, butt lifts, body lifts. And for the past month, every single time she's scrubbed in with me, I'm like, okay, but this is not a typical body lift. This is not a typical tummy tuck. This is an aberrancy. <laughs> she's like, oh, Okay. And then the next week she scrubs it and I'm like, okay, give it. this one isn't typical either. This is, this is not the usual amount that I take off. And then week three and then week four. And she's like, are you sure, Dr. Ravello? Because like, this is everyone that you do. This seems pretty typical. It seems pretty typical. And I'm like, ah, oh, gosh, darn it. <laughs> yeah, didn't you say that you've taken off more than your actual weight in uh, skin and in fat fact, with the paniculectomies and, and abdominoplasties that you've done? This month I have, yes. And so- That's a lot. It's a lot, you know, and there's a, there's lots of reasons for it. And so I want to go into what those reasons are. And what really is important, sort of why we're here, is the safety of it, because that's, that's what always comes up. Um, and so typically, these are patients in my world who have had a weight loss surgery. So they've had a bariatric surgery for weight loss, gastric sleeve, gastric bypass, and they've lost... X amount of pounds. And now they're coming in because they have extra skin hanging down that they can't get rid of through diet and exercise because it's extra skin. Some patients come in after losing 100 pounds, 120 pounds, and they're all skin. And what I take off from those patients doesn't usually weigh that much. But then I have some patients who, for whatever reason, they keep all of their extra weight in their abdomen. And so they have these skinny legs and these skinny arms, and they've sort of plateaued from a weight loss standpoint, and everything they have is concentrated in their abdomen. And those are the patients that I'm taking off a lot of pounds, like actual pounds of weight. And interesting that when you take it off and weigh it, By then it weighs less than it actually did because all the kind of the water fluid weights out of it once you've taken it off the patient. So it's actually even more More. than what you took off. Even actually even more. So for comparison purposes here, you know, obviously it's going to, there's going to be a range of sizes and every person's different, but in a non weight loss patient, maybe a mom that's had a couple kids normal to maybe a little bit overweight BMI. If you do a tummy tuck on that patient, you're going to take off anywhere from two to five pounds. That's that's pushing it for those patients usually. Yeah. Um, the numbers that I were doing this month started out with 16 pounds and then 17 pounds, 18 pounds, and then almost 20 pounds. I mean, those are huge 
huge, 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 huge numbers. And of those four, three of them were from just removal of skin in the abdominal region. One of them was an actual circumferential body lift where I took some skin and fat from the buttock area as well as from the abdomen. But the buttock area is like two pounds. That doesn't add a whole lot. The majority of it's coming from the central abdominal area. For our European listeners, just divide by 2.2 on those poundages <laughs> and you'll get the kilogram weights you the and you'll be all set. But uh, yeah, I mean, it it's impressive. I, I can tell you that these body lifts are they're not simple and oh, they're they're a physiologic hit i mean yeah. i remember you were telling me about one of them and i was just like god you know like icu yeah. afterwards or like where is that patient going you go oh yeah we send them to the icu just to watch them and monitor and, and i think that's not a bad idea because there there are physiologic considerations when you're taking you know when some person a patient is taking such a big surgical hit because surgery is it's traumatizing to the body. You're taking right. the skin it's off. A big hit. I mean, people are trying to do all this minimally invasive operations uh, like that. This is maximally and it's, in, it's as big as they come. Maximally invasive as you come. And and just to clarify, I, I don't send patients to the ICU, um, but I do definitely keep all these patients overnight in the hospital with close monitoring, checking their vitals. I have their medicine doctors on board following them as well. So they are they are definitely monitored closely. These are not patients of that course. I would do in an outpatient surgery center, not patients I would send home. So it comes down to the, from the very beginning when you're evaluating these patients. Because um, not everybody is going to be a candidate for these kind of surgeries. And I think there are a large majority of plastic surgeons who would look at these patients and go, nope, 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 not a chance, not doing it, not a candidate. Um, and for me, I really look at the patient as a whole, like what is their overall health status? Um, what is their functional status? Are they walking, talking, breathing fine? They're not on oxygen. They're not you know, using a wheelchair. Like, Are they overall healthy, functional people that can withstand a big surgery? And have they more or less plateaued at their weight loss? Because you can tell somebody, oh, well, you need to lose another 50 pounds, but there's not a chance they will. They've plateaued. This is their sort of normal weight for them. And asking them to lose more weight, it's not gonna happen. So then I have to decide, is this is a surgery that their bodies can handle from a functional standpoint, and can I do it safely? And usually I can. If their diabetes is controlled or they're non-diabetic and they don't have any heart problems or not on you know massive blood thinners or anything like that, there is a way that it can be done safely. They got to get teed up beforehand by their medical doctors. They got to have all their blood work and their EKGs and all of that tip top. And then you go to surgery and you are extremely meticulous. You know, you have an anesthesiologist there that's closely monitoring their fluids. You have catheters in their bladder monitoring how much output's coming out. And then the surgery itself this is not something you just cut and burn through. You got to make sure you're not bleeding. I don't like blood in any of my surgeries, but especially if I'm taking 20 pounds off a patient, they can't be bleeding from those 20 pounds. Like you got to have excellent hemostasis because you do not want to be losing a bunch of blood. So you just, you stay safe, you go slow, you get all your bleeders, and then afterwards you send the patient to a place where they can be monitored. And I just, you know, these patients do pretty well. They really do. Now yours do great and they look great. I mean, these are, these are really big ass body lifts. Big I mean, they are lifts. not, they are no joke. And, you know, it takes somebody really special to do it because you do have to pay attention to all the parameters. And a lot of times they have these comorbidities, other health problems that are very real and that you have to manage. And you can, you can do it. And by taking all this weight off of them, they get even better. They get better. And that's the thing. It's like, yes, this is, we're taking a big leap here and doing this really big surgery. But the end point, they are healthier. They're not walking around with these giant bellies hanging down. They, they are trim. They are slim people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> They can go out and exercise. They can go on that hike. They can move faster just on a regular basis because they're not carrying around all this extra weight. So once they get through that initial recovery period, I mean, these patients, they are so grateful usually for the most part, and their lives are dramatically changed. Absolutely. And I, and I see it with my own eyes. I mean, these folks really do great and they look great and it, they feel better about themselves. So they, much they better. They can exercise more easily with the skin out of the way. They don't have the infections in the skin folds. There's so much benefit to these operations that you do. It, it's, it's just 
frankly incredible. And I'm glad that you do them because <laughs> they are hard. And I think they're for the uh, younger surgeon to do than the uh, the guys who've been around a little bit like I have. But uh, I, I mean, kudos to you for taking great care of this uh, these patients who really need the surgery and they need it done well. Yeah, and that's the thing. I have a hard time saying no because I really feel like they could benefit so well from it. There are some patients, you know, if <laughs> if I'm telling you you're not a candidate for this surgery, take that very seriously because if I'm telling you no then then we really need to know no one should be doing this surgery. But in general, you know, not everyone's a candidate for the full, um, you know, super fancy body lifts and liposuction and muscle repair. Sometimes that is too much for a patient. But sometimes they just need like an area removed and, and we can make it work. There's usually ways we can make it work for them um, to get them feeling better and looking better. What What do you tell the patients when they come in and they, they kind of want to do everything all at once because, you know, that's usually the, uh, the big trick. There's the, like they'd like to just – I just want to, like, knock this out at one time. I mean, staging them, I think, is really, really important. And it's super important. I mean, especially because I do take my time. So, um, you know, I don't like doing more than one or two areas. And I, th- I think that is where you get into trouble from um, an overall uh, homeostatic – a perspective. Most of the time, I'm just focusing on the trunk region with these large body lifts. And that seems to be fairly well tolerated because even though we've disrupted some drainage channels, there are plenty of other drainage channels coming up from the legs, from the arms, from the head and neck area. And there's really just sort of one area that the body has to focus on healing and that the surgeon has to pay attention to. But when you start talking about doing arms and then legs and then tummies, all of this at the same time, that's where I think the body really struggles to heal. And and there is such a thing as surgeon fatigue. Like you can do a really good job on one area when you're really focusing and paying attention to it. But once you start adding that second and third area, like your brain gets exhausted after a while. You yeah. know, maybe you'll take some shortcuts here and there. And maybe not. Maybe some people are just more excellent than I am. But because I do take a while to do any given area, it's hard for me to do more than one or two at a time. Yeah, that was sort of my rule when I was doing these operations. I was like, I'll do the circumferential and one other thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that was sort of where I drew the line. And I also draw the line in terms of hours of surgery. So I think there's something to that. I think once you start to get to that eight hour mark, you know, first of all, it is probably better to be in the hospital. Um, oh, for sure. The, the yeah. outpatient surgery center is not a place for that kind of, uh, of uh, length of surgery. Um, but also, you know, you have to think about, you know, when does the rate of infection go up? When does the fat necrosis right. start to go up? When do they have pulmonary emboli- embolism? These these things that start to become sort of uh, critical and they're critical in a time when uh, you really need them to be kind of sailing easy. You don't want these big hiccups and, and bumps in the road when you've made these you know big incisions on arms or legs and, and circumferential around the trunk you want them to have like a, a clean shot at healing. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think time in the OR definitely contributes. I don't really get too hung up on it though. I mean, I think back to our residency days, we would do free flaps for 24 hours, you know, and those patients, That's right. they would do fine, you know, for the most part, like if they had complications, it wasn't usually from the anesthesia overall standpoint. It was from the surgery itself probably. So if you're otherwise healthy and you have a healthy heart and lung system, I don't get too worried about the length of the surgery, as long as it's progressing smoothly and you're not having complications. You know, I, I don't get too worried about it, but I do see the reasons, you know, why you wouldn't want to just keep adding to a surgery for the sake of while you're already there. Well, you're also in the hospital. So and I'm in the hospital. In that the is hospital true. is totally different. In the yeah. hospital, that is that is a different setting. There's specialists available. You have different equipment. Right. It's, it's a whole different animal. I'm, my, my concern is always in the outpatient center. Oh, yeah. That's where I... That's that's my that's hang. your home. <laughs> that's where I tend to to hang out. I I try to avoid the hospital. Like I just try to avoid hospitals. Period. Like as a patient, as a doctor, <laughs> I just I don't really like hospitals. Is that true. it's just not my place. But um, you know, we need them. They need to be there. We do some stuff there when we have you know big stuff to do. Mm-hmm. Um, if I had a body lift, I would take it to you know Cedars or wherever and you know get it done there. But you know, for for what you're doing and you're doing it in your home hospital. Incredible. Great work uh, and kudos to you. 
What's the future of these body lifts? What do you see coming down the road that's going to make them uh, more effective, that are going to make them easier to go through? What, what's coming for plastic surgeons in the future and to make their patients heal better? Unfortunately, I just see patients getting larger. <laughs> that's sort of what I see in the future. Um, yeah. Cynical Tinker Bell. Yeah, why is um, that? <laughs> why is that? Why are they getting know. bigger? I don't know. I don't is, know. Is this the problem right in front of us? <laughs> I know, maybe. Instead of buying two, now you get to buy four Reese's Peanut Butter Cups at one time? Yeah, that could be it. Um, in the future, what what, prob- what issues do I see? Um, I don't know. I, mean, I think we're just going to see overall better techniques the more we do this. Because I, th- I, th- I do think actually what we're going to see are more and more people operating on larger patients. Um, and that envelope's going to keep getting pushed. And the more envelopes keep getting pushed, the more surgeons get more innovative and develop more techniques and find better ways of dealing with what was otherwise considered a prohibitive surgery. So I think that people are just going to get more comfortable doing these larger patients and find ways and, and recognize the ways that, that can keep them safe. You know, we used to have like strict BMI cutoffs. Oh, I don't do surgery on anybody with a BMI over 30 or 35. And I think just because of the way our population's going, we're going to have to find ways to do surgery on these larger patients. Yeah. I mean, they are they certainly want it. You know, yeah. there, there's no shortage of the desire to, to have these operations to, you know, get their bodies down to a different size. And, and really, I, I think the the physiologic and hygiene issues that come with uh, these, you know, high BMIs are real. And these operations really take care of that. They really do. They do. They They solve the problem. They really solve the problem. And I don't put a huge, like speaking of BMIs, a huge emphasis on a BMI number alone. Yes, we do have very real data that shows that the higher the BMI, the higher the risk complications. That is very true. That is very real. The higher the BMI you have, the higher chance you have of having complications. And that's just a known fact. But when it comes to an individual surgery, I also really look at where the weight's distributed. Um, You know, someone might just carry it all in their hips and thighs and be an amazing candidate for a tummy tuck. So it's it's not a hard and fast rule for me. I look at the patients. I look at what I can accomplish. um, And I think that approach is just going to continue to evolve. Well, it sounds very good. And I I am... As I said, I've watched you, you know, really take this on as a part of your practice and you've made huge advances and strides for your patients. So I'm, I'm impressed. I think anybody that's considering a, uh, a body lift should definitely make their way to California <laughs> for you to do it. Uh, just and plan on staying a while because the recovery a while. Is, is, is a whole nother thing as well. It is. I mean, that, and that, yeah. that's, a, that's a podcast in and of itself. Yeah. Well, Dr. Ravello, anything else you want to add to your big ass body lift podcast, The Babbles? No, just, you know, throw those little snicker bars over here. <laughs> you <laughs> made me hungry. I will do that. They're, they're just out in front of us. It's like, okay, I guess, I guess that's dinner. Eat them. <laughs> <laughs> These are definitely not making it home, that's for sure. Well, this is the Beverly Hills Plastic Surgery Podcast coming to you from the 90210.